Welcome back to History 4314, American History Through Film. Today, we're going to look at Hollywood as cultural mythmaker. We're going to look at the way that Hollywood shaped the very way we view our country's history and the way we view our role in the world. And we're going to look at the rise and fall of Hollywood's most influential film genre. We're going to look at the Western. But before we begin with that, we're going to look at a film that we're going to discuss at the end of our last class before we were cut off by the end of time. We're going to talk about Forrest Gump for a few moments because this film, I think, shows how Hollywood helps us to understand the times that we live in and the very direction of change in a way that professional historians do not do. Forrest Gump touched the American psyche in a way that few other recent films have achieved. The film, of course, tells the story of a simpleton with a heart of gold who ricochets through the last three decades like a ball in a pinball machine and somehow comes up a winner every time. Even though he only has an IQ of 75, even though his legs were crippled in childhood, Forrest Gump grows into a college graduate and an all-American football star. He goes to Vietnam, he becomes a war hero, he stumbles into business, and becomes a millionaire. It's a remarkable story that sounds patently absurd, and yet it struck a chord with people. And we're going to try to explain how. He bumbles innocently through flower power, dope, and disco. He stays faithful to his rebellious teenage love object and is left nurturing their child, that is, hope and redemption, when she dies of AIDS. And all the while, he is kind and caring and not at all greedy, and despite repeated tragedy in his life, he's not left bitter or cynical or twisted. So why did this sentimental story somehow connect to people in the way that only a handful of films do? Now, I should emphasize that critics were quick to point out the film's flaws. They took a dim view of the movie when it opened. They regarded the movie as a slick pop masterpiece with a schmaltzy, empty core. Newsweek ended its review with the words, the whole seems less than the sum of its parts. But audiences totally disagreed with the critics. Forrest Gump was an enormous success, and it was a success because it was the latest celebration of what we'll call American innocence. American innocence. Hollywood has always associated simple minds with virtue and intelligence with villainy. And there have been lots of films in recent years that you're familiar with that have that theme. Uh, Dustin Hoffman as the idiot savant in Rain Man, or Peter Sellers as the gardener in Being There. What Hollywood seems to tell us is that those with simple minds have an understanding that is deeper and more profound than those with conventional intelligence. Now, Gump is, of course, the latest version of a kind of hero popularized by Frank Capra back in the 1930s. This is the plain man, and he is an old American tradition. It's the idea that Americans, through their very innocence, will always stumble through and they will always succeed. So Forrest Gump may have shortcomings, but these shortcomings are greatly overcompensated for by his essential goodness 
innocence and accidental wisdom. Uh, and clearly, part of the popularity of this film was that at a time when the White House was marred by scandal, viewers felt inspired by Forrest Gump's simplicity, his guilelessness, his goodness. For a nation long on cynicism and painfully short on heroes, Gump was gobbled up by the Hollywood audience. The audience was hungry for someone who was decent and honest and optimistic and good. We wanted to believe that basic virtues can prevail, that innocence doesn't have to be a liability. Now, of course, Forrest Gump was so blank that it was possible for people to project their fantasies on him, no matter what those fantasies might be. Both liberals and conservatives found something attractive in Forrest Gump's story, so it was the perfect hero. The hero's appeal is that you could read into him what you wanted, and this was quite intentional on the part of Robert Zemeckis, who uh, produced the movie. He said he wanted to present this generation without commenting on it. Because of Forrest blankness, everybody could bring their own bottle to the party, he would say. So for liberals, Forrest Gump exalts the common man, his innate goodness, and his hostility to racism. Its hero is disabled, and there is racial cooperation in the film, even though Forrest Gump is, of course, named after the founder of the Ku Klux Klan. Gump's the son of a single mother, and the film includes coded attacks on child abuse and wife beating. The message is that virtue is simple, and virtue all by itself is effective. He's a white southerner raised by a salty but loving single mother after the disappearance of his father. Gump instinctively believes in racial and social justice. As a young man, he shakes hands with John F. Kennedy. Does that remind you of anybody? Uh, of course, it was modeled Bill on who? Bill Clinton. On Bill Clinton. And yet, conservatives, too, could see in Forrest Gump what they wanted to. Pat Buchanan, the presidential candidate and right-wing pundit, praised Forrest Gump as, at its core, a conservative film. The slow-witted young man loves his mother, fights for his country, and dreams of nothing more than having a family of his own. The ultra-conservative preacher Pat Robertson praised Gump as revealing, quote, some tiny cell of conservatism burrowing deep inside the Hollywood elite, which had been regarded as a temple of liberalism since McCarthy days. For the new right, the movie underscored the battle between two cultures, the squalid counterculture spawned by pedophile abuse, devoid of respect, loyalty, or responsibility, versus the footsure culture of hometown, homegrown decency, in which the intellect is pretentious clatter, and what matters is a good Christian heart. The film portrays the counterculture of the 1960s as hypocritical, as hollow, as destructive. And for conservatives, Forrest Gump is ultimately redeemed by home, by his virtue, by marriage, and having a child. And so this film was perfectly calculated to speak to the divided mind of the baby boomers of the 1960s. Gump is not the real man of action like Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's not the new man of male weepies like Kevin Costner. He is 
what I'd call the child man. Non-political, non-judgmental, a witness to this country's darkest hours of racial segregation, the Vietnam War, the Kennedy assassination, and the plague of AIDS. He endures and he even triumphs with his witlessness intact and therefore he absolves our nation, his girlfriend, his best friend of all their sins along the way. Americans, in short, made Forrest Gump a hit precisely because it spoke to their needs. It offered a hopeful vision of American history, and it also offered a reconstructed vision of Americans of themselves. Gump is less intelligent than most people around him, but he adheres to the principle his mother taught him, and he works hard at whatever task confronts him, and he manages not only to get through, but to triumph over those who are his, quote unquote, betters. So what the film does, I think, is it reconstructs an old American myth, a myth that had been shattered by the tumultuous 1960s. And it is by reconstructing an older myth that the movie hits connects to the American psyche and succeeds at the box office. That myth was that America is a well-intentioned, though sometimes clumsy giant, a giant that muddles through the world trying to do good, often shedding its goodness in ways that it can hardly understand Yet ultimately, America is the world's savior, a world that can never quite appreciate the benefits that it receives from our country. It's a complicated myth, but I think it's one that's deeply rooted in people's minds and that Forrest Gump reactivated. This belief that Americans are well-intentioned and benevolent though clumsy, and that we're doing our best and in the long run the world benefits from this. So Gump's America is pretty much like the America of Frank Capra that we've talked about in earlier classes. It's a America without class divisions. It's America with no deeply rooted ineradicable history of racism. It's America with no history of genocide of Indians, an America with no deep-rooted sexism or homophobia or anti-Semitism or alienation. Gump walks through life with an innocence and kindness that redeems everyone around him. And so he is American self-image of themselves, maybe not too bright but well-intentioned nonetheless. Everyone touched by Forrest Gump is transformed without ever having to work on anything inside themselves, without ever having to confront the evil that surrounds them, without ever having to question the assumptions of their society, without ever having to make any inner or outer change. Now it just so happens that along the way, Gump becomes rich by chance. A hurricane destroys all the competing shrimp boats, but we don't, of course, see anything about those shrimpers who lost everything. Uh, we don't learn about those who lose because Gump makes lots of money on his investments. He just triumphs, and there's no costs to his triumph. All the film's characters are metaphors for different aspects of late 20th century America. Forrest, of course, represents what is honest and decent and virtuous and naive. 
Jenny, the love of his life, was abused as a child. She's a person, we all know such people, who desperately longs for something to believe in, and she pursues self-realization as a nude folk singer, a hippie, a war protester, a drug addict, and a single parent. And then there's Bubba, the African-American soldier from Louisiana who shares Forrest's outsider status, decency, and limited brain power. He's cannon fodder, the tragic American who did what he thought was right because someone else told him to do it. And then there is Lieutenant Dan, another Vietnam casualty. He's a career soldier from a long line of officers who died with their boots on. But instead of a glorious death in combat, Lieutenant Dan is saved by an uncomprehending forest for a bitter amputee's existence stateside. But even though he is cynical and has blood on his hands, even he is ultimately a hopeful character. So Gump is a character who has lived through what a generation of Americans also lived through. An America shaped by war, by assassins' bullets, and by dysfunctional homes. But in the end, he is not bitter. He is not a cynic. Rather, he is a healing figure, eager to put the country's past behind him to embrace idealism and hope. So this carefully constructed film reconstructs the whole meaning of 30 years of American history. It portrays those 30 years as almost unbroken tragedy in which the proper attitude is to remain hopeful, naive, innocent, and virtuous and overcome that past. So the film presents the history of the United States from 1963 onward as a series of tragedies. But in the process, it reinforces and reconstructs older Hollywood themes. That divine providence, in the end, will always protect Americans from themselves. That the good-hearted American will always persist and always prevail against adversity. In other words, what Forrest Gump does is much what 30s films were so successful at, and that is to helping older American values survive in times when they've been subjected to deep challenge. So let's end up our story of history goes to the movies. History movies are not grade school lesson plans. No one ever went to a movie expecting to learn much about history. Historical movies, rather, are an odd mixture of truth, illusion, history, and fantasy. The movies mix up all of these elements in a stew that entertains many and infuriates historians. But these movies are so powerful that we come away convinced that Cleopatra looked just like Elizabeth Taylor and that Moses and Michelangelo both look like Charleston Heston. Ah, remarkable. History can bring the past to life in a way that nothing else is capable of doing. And these fictionalized recreations of the past dominate our imagination. They shape the very way we conceive of earlier epics. Now, presenting history on the screen is not a simple issue. Movie makers often claim 
that they strive for authenticity. But a collection of facts is no more than an almanac, and authenticity is not what historical movies truly offer, even if the shirts on Leonardo DiCaprio's shirt are exactly right for the time period, uh, the buttons on his shirt. History is not just facts. History is an interpretation of facts. Even objective history has a point of view. And if we want to truly understand other people, if we want to truly understand the past, if we want a deeper knowledge of character, philosophy, and politics, we must go beyond the facts. We must go into the realm of imagination and interpretation. One of William Faulkner's characters in the novel Absalom, Absalom said, there is a might have been which is more true than truth. And that is what the greatest movies can tap into. That is what the greatest fiction can tap into. It can read between the facts and uncover meaning. Filmmakers need dramatic license if they are to discover the more profound truths. What's wrong with a film like Amistad by Steven Spielberg was that it meant to be true to the facts. But that's not what we really want to know. If you want to know the, what happened day by day, read a book. But if you want to truly understand Sing K and the Amistad rebels, that's when you need a great filmmaker or a great novelist because you have to transcend the facts to get to historical truth. The very best historical films challenge deeply ingrained mythologies. They force us to confront the true complexity of the past. And so we're going to turn in just a few moments to Hollywood's greatest success in myth-making, the Western. And then, if we still have time, we're going to look at Hollywood's depiction of women and femininity. But let me just give you a few words about history, excuse me, about film and ideology. Film and ideology. The basic argument that I have been making to you for the last five class sessions is this. Films are not simply innocent entertainments. Movies transmit powerful ideological messages. They give us our deepest lessons in masculinity and femininity, about social class, about America's proper role in the world. Films, in short, are educators, but ten times more effective than the best teachers. Superficially, Hollywood's movies are highly realistic, yet that realism is carefully shaped and carefully sculpted. It looks real, but it is constructed reality. Hollywood never shows anyone going to the bathroom, except I guess in Lethal Weapon 4. Uh, it rarely shows people working. It never shows people worrying about money. In the movies, even teenagers drive fancy cars fancier than the ones you see in the U of H parking lot. Uh, in other words, they look real, but if you look closely, it's not the reality that you and I inhabit. Hollywood's ideology cannot be easily pigeonholed. Uh, it can't simply be labeled liberal or conservative. Hollywood has, for example, a very inverse class snobbery. 
the people who work in Hollywood may be among the richest Americans there are. But on the screen, you can rest assured that working people are always more morally upright than rootless urban sophisticates with money and professional careers. Lower in Hollywood is better and more authentic, which does not mean that Tom Hanks is going to take any less money to make a movie. Similarly, lack of intelligence equals practical and moral wisdom. And the epitome of that tradition was, of course, Forrest Gump. It's interesting. So if stupid is virtuous and really smart, then smart is ultimately stupid. And that's part of Hollywood's ideology, too. Scientists are almost always motivated by dangerous hubris or pride or arrogance. Just remember the Jurassic Park movies as a recent example of that theme. Professors, well, they're virtually always jokes in Hollywood film. Uh, lawyers, they're not geniuses, but they're brilliant actors in the courtroom. Conversely, if you ever see a wise-cracking waitress in a film, you know that she stands for virtue and practical wisdom. So there is an implicit ideology in Hollywood films repeated again and again and again. Now sometimes that ideology is what I would call transparent. It's obvious to everyone who's looking at the movie. If you see a crime movie, you can rest assured it will feature a judge who is soft on crime, it will feature the victimization of decent people. It will expose the inexplicable malevolence of violent criminals who aren't motivated by greed, but they're really psychopaths. And it will reveal the degeneracy of the drug culture. If you go to a crime movie, you expect all those themes to be there, and you'll hardly ever be disappointed. The police station, indeed, is the only place where men and women are shown doing blue-collar work at the movies. And stores only exist to be robbed. Uh, but most of the time, Hollywood's ideology is not so transparent as it is in crime movies. For the most part, Hollywood's ideology is invisible. That is, it doesn't seem like an ideology at all. It seems like common sense. It's what everybody believes. And that's just how Hollywood wants it to be perceived. So let's take a look. What are some of the features of that ideology? Well, crime doesn't pay. The law must not be flouted. If you flout the law, you'll pay a price. But the movies also say that formal legalism is too rigid. Uh, you can look at film after film, and if you carry the law out too precisely, it's going to lead to injustice. And that could be seen in I Am a Fugitive and a Chain Gang from the 1930s, and it could be seen in Unforgiven in the 1990s. The themes persist. You also have the reluctant hero who, disillusioned with compromise, disillusioned with corruption, has retreated from a career of action. From Humphrey Bogart to Clint Eastwood, there comes a moment of truth when he finally recognizes his obligation to defy evil. And this, too, is part of Hollywood's ideology that persists decade after decade. One of the major ideological goals of Hollywood culture is to heal all social divisions, to bridge divides that separate people. 
So in film, loners always eventually join the team. In film, atheists will eventually be caught praying in foxholes. In film, pacifists will eventually endorse violence. And in film, divorced couples are almost invariably reconciled. Uh, one of the more recent uh, examples is Liar, Liar with Jim Carrey. Uh, and all those messages seem pretty straightforward to us, but sometimes the messages are not so innocent. They're not so innocuous. For example, independent women are almost always punished in Hollywood films. We'll see more of that when we talk about the treatment of gender in Hollywood film. Uh, let me give you another not so innocuous message. In recent films, casting is arranged so that white men do not oppress women or minorities. And this is done very intentionally. So in Philadelphia, the Academy Award winning film with Tom Hanks, the law firm being sued by a dying Tom Hanks is represented by a white woman and a black man. That way, it's not white men persecuting someone suffering by AIDS. Others are standing in in that role. In Hollywood fantasies such as Rocky or Saturday Night Fever or Flashdance, the working class is something that you escape from. Uh, the goal is not to be working class. It's to transcend from it. Thus, in Pretty Woman, an absurd and an insipid fiction about a reformed prostitute who snares a rich man, uh, before TV began to have uh, shows about how to marry a millionaire, uh, we see a woman trading her body for money and love in exchange for upward mobility. Now, this is not an attack on sexual exploitation at all. In essence, it's a sort of celebration of it in a weird way. If you spell out the plot, it sounds very offensive, and yet it was a huge hit. A basic Hollywood truism is that the basic audience consists of heterosexual couples among whom men or boys make most of the decisions as to what to do for entertainment. And so the ideologies are tailored for a very particular audience. Young people today are the most reliable film audience. They have more free time and more disposable money to spend on leisure activities than anyone else in America. And this helps shape the films that are produced. Uh, although women will more or less cheerfully go to films by, about, and for men, men will not do the reverse. Uh, and you can see this in film uh, lists. Rarely in recent years has there been more than one actress among the top ten money makers in Hollywood. Rarely does a woman's film, the kind of film we'll talk about in a little while, a quote-unquote tearjerker, reach the heights of profitability that constitutes a blockbuster. So, in other words, ideology runs through Hollywood films. This ideology is largely invisible to the audience, and it's invisible because it's meant to be invisible. And yet, at the same time, Hollywood is transmitting very powerful messages. Now, we're going to talk about a film genre that was once the most popular film genre in America, but a film genre which has now fallen onto hard times. 
and we're going to look at ideology in the Western. And before we do, we need to talk about the key Western hero, John Wayne. If we could have the overhead projector, please. Thank you. Uh, it may seem absolutely incredible, but according to the annual Harris survey, the most popular box office uh, actor in 1995 was John Wayne. He may have been dead for a decade, but in virtually every year when they conduct this survey, John Wayne comes out either one or two among the actors that Americans most admire. It's just incredible. And the reason, I think, is simple. John Wayne personified an American myth. John Wayne symbolized something to Americans. He was the man of instinct and independence. He was the man in touch with nature. He was the man distrustful of government institutions, skeptical of experts. In other words, John Wayne seemed to symbolize for many Americans a whole confluence of values and beliefs. He wasn't born John Wayne. He was born Marion Michael Morrison, and it's awfully hard to believe he would have become such an icon if he had kept that name. He was born in Iowa in 1907, but he didn't come to represent the Midwest. He came to represent the Far West, the man of the West, brave, honest, upright, and true. He was like the Western landscape. He was oversized, powerful, and dramatic. Over the years, he would lose the smooth, fresh handsomeness of his youth. His hair fell out, his waist thickened, his face became lined and weathered. But those changes all made him more appealing, more attractive. His face began to take on a sort of chiseled Mount Rushmore quality. He began to look more like a Westerner and less like an actor. Since the 1920s, he had starred in over 150 films. And in virtually every one of those films, he played exactly the same character. He was the independent man who rose tall in the saddle the man who confronted evil on deserted streets at high noon, the man who protected innocent women and children. Now, John Wayne, even in films, was not a nice guy. You could tell in all of his films that he wasn't going to slap you on the back. There was a surliness, a meanness, to John Wayne, a roughness that always manifested itself in his coarse, blunt language. He always acted like a bull in a china shop. He wasn't someone that you would take to a refined parlor. He was a man's man, and there's no doubt that that was a big part of his appeal. He was not a feat. He was no sissy. Yet during the 1960s and 1970s, no one seemed more out of step with the times, more out of step with the social and cultural changes of the era than John Wayne. His critics described him as a political Neanderthal. His attitudes about patriotism and national loyalty seemed hopelessly naive. 
He preached individuality in an age of bureaucracy. He preached laissez-faire capitalism in an age of liberalism and social engineering. No one seemed more detached from the changing America. He publicly denounced coddling criminals. He publicly denounced social welfare programs. He said, I won't go along with this new thing of genuflecting to the downtrodden. Uh, at a time when Hollywood would make no films about the Vietnam War, he made a movie called The Green Berets that portrayed Vietnam simply as an updated version of World War II. He was not afraid to show where he stood on issues. But if liberals condemned John Wayne's views, conservatives embraced them. And for tens of millions of Americans, John Wayne embodied America. He, tall, rugged, forthright, and independent, he was the very essence of America. And indeed, I suspect to the entire world, John Wayne remains the very symbol of the Western hero, a figure deeply rooted in our imagination. Now, I'd like us to briefly look at a film clip. We're going to look at a clip from the film High Noon, Gary Cooper, 1952, which shows the Western hero in action. If we could have the clip right there. Now, High Noon is, of course, the Western as civics lesson. It is the classic tale of the marshal who fights alone for law and order while the townspeople are paralyzed by fear. But this vision of the man who stands tall in the saddle, who will walk out on high noon and face a gunman, this became America's very symbol of itself and became the figure that John Wayne would epitomize. In John Wayne's films, Easterners are portrayed as corrupt and effete, men who control power to the detriment of the people. And Westerners, in contrast, are portrayed as freedom-loving, independent sorts who only want to escape the domination of Eastern bankers and Eastern land agents. In short, John Wayne came to personify a deeply rooted American myth. Fearless, feared by others, he was the killer who cleansed the world of things that needed killing. And so he has blood on his hands, but it's blood shed for a good purpose. And this message sent in film after film after film became, in my view, the defining characteristic of the American ideology. John Wayne's character was always rootless, but he always carried his own code of honor. All societies have myths, and John Wayne is a perfect figure to lead us into our society's myths, a myth which has declined and fragmented in recent years, and therefore we're able to see it better than people would have been able to see it two decades or three decades ago. A myth is a set of stories and a set of images that contains lessons and that are essential parts of our worldview. So myths aren't just fictional stories. 
Myths are stories that speak to us, that tell us who we are and what we stand for and how we should act and behave. Myths shape our behavior, and Hollywood was our greatest cultural myth maker. Myths are always rooted in historical reality, but myths always outlive the realities that produce them. Now, in quote-unquote simple societies, or quote-unquote primitive societies, myths are produced by easily identifiable figures. They're created by a village elder, or a sage, or by a priest. But who creates myths in a modern, complex, bureaucratic society? Who's responsible for creating myths for us? We don't have sages. We don't have elders. Our priests don't serve the same function. How are myths created in modern America? What do you think? We look to our past, the independence movement and uh, the Old West. Okay, we, we look to our past, and then it's the mass media that translates those images into meaningful lessons for us. In complex societies, myth-making is the product of popular culture. And in modern America, it's not just popular culture. It is a real industry that creates myths, a culture industry, just as Detroit produces an auto industry. Now, as we've already seen in our course, it was in the late 19th century that the culture industry first arose, an industry that for the first time was capable of influencing people's thinking in every part of the nation. By the 1920s, this culture industry dominated our national culture. It was responsible for creating and disseminating our dominant myths and our dominant ideologies. So, let me ask you a question. Is there a small group of people in a small room carefully devising these myths? What do the American people need to know? Is that what's going on? Is that what myth-making means in a complex society? That it's like the way Windows is manufactured? What do you think? Yes. Well, I think it's not so much they look at the American people and say what we need. They look at us and say what are the problems that are going on and how can we give them something that will help solve some of these problems. Yes, please. Could it be more as, I mean, I don't know, I'm just guessing, but could it be more as what we can handle? What, not let me just offer advice that's always good, and that is, I had a friend who's now a very prominent historian who played ping pong, and her ping pong instructor said, always make your mistakes with confidence. Always say, and this is the way it is, with confidence, and people will believe you nine-tenths of the time. Yeah. I was thinking that perhaps they sat around and decided what they could sell. Yeah, I think all of these are, are aspects of what's going on. Hollywood does not create myths in a vacuum. It creates myths that address real people's needs and that people are willing to spend money on. On the other hand, if you've ever been to Beverly Hills or Bel Air or elsewhere, of Santa Monica, you know that Hollywood people aren't the normal people you run into every day of your life. Uh, they're richer, for one thing, uh, poorer educated, for another. Uh, they're, they're different than you and me. So they're both responsive and they're different, too. Uh, perhaps the greatest accomplishment of the culture industry was to shape 
our national self-image around the Western hero. Now the goal of commercial media is to win as wide an audience as possible. And therefore, whatever it creates must be responsive to the audience's needs and to the audience's desires. But the mass media is also dominated by a relatively small group of people, people who are not representative of the population as a whole. And so they're responsive, yet they bring their own concerns and their own needs to what they create. And sometimes they connect and sometimes they don't. Screenwriters, novelists, and artists all stand at a remove from the audience. And they're constantly trying to guess what the audience wants. They're trying to anticipate social trends. Most movies are made a year or two before uh, they're released. And therefore, they have to be very attuned to what they think other people are thinking or going to think. So to improve the odds for success, these people rely heavily on cliches, or they're not called cliches in Hollywood. They're called conventions, or they're called stereotypes, or they're called genres, or they're called mythic images, because these almost always work. And of all the conventions that these Hollywood people drew upon, for decades, the most important was the mythology of the American West. The mythology of the American West. The basic myth that Hollywood put forward in film after film is the frontier and our hero as the lone frontiersman. Freedom is out on the plains under the endless sky. To become citified was to lose touch with all that's authentic, all that is natural, all that's valuable. And we still see this on the screen, this theme. Just take a look at the recent uh, Billy Crystal film, City Slickers, which is just an updating of this old adage that Hollywood has argued for decades. Needless to say, no one from Santa Monica is going to move to the Wild West, except maybe to a big ranch in Montana. Now, where did this mythology come from? Because Hollywood did not invent it. In 1890, the U.S. Census announced that the American frontier was closed. It declared that all the vacant land in America had been settled. There was no more western frontier. And when that happened, the United States went literally through an identity crisis. The United States was desperate to find new frontiers. Americans deeply believed that our national character had been shaped by the frontier experience. And without a frontier, we would become like the English or the French. We'd lose whatever it was that made us distinctively American. And it's then that America found its hero, a hero it would hold on to for the next 70 years, and that hero was the cowboy. If in real life the frontier had vanished, then in fantasy the frontier remained. And we could always imagine ourselves, we could fantasize ourselves as if we were cowboys. 
Now, there's more to this myth than just the hero. There's also the story of conflict. And this, too, was created during the 1890s and first decade of the 20th century. What this myth does is it portrays all of American history as a series of violent conflicts, a series of conflicts between us and them, between us and an alien other. Now, what are some of those conflicts? They're all readily familiar to us. One is the conflict between us and a dangerous natural environment, an environment that needs to be tamed, that needs to be developed. Okay. A second conflict that lies at the very heart of this mythology is the conflict between Westerners and Easterners. What are some other conflicts that are part of this mythology? Oh, come on. It, you, you know them. Uh, well, I'm not a real Western fan, yeah. but didn't some of them have a lot to do with the conflicts between us and the Native Americans? Yes. I mean, isn't that crucial? that the conflict between us, whoever that is, and the other is often Native Americans. Between good guys and bad guys, between civilization and savagery. So the Western myth is not just a celebration of the cowboy as our self-image of ourselves that we're all somehow John Wayne. It's more than that. It's a story of conflict in which we triumph over some other, with a capital O, something alien to us. And that's what a myth is all about, right? It's not just a celebration of one thing. It's a story we tell about ourselves that gives meaning to everything that we do. And we're going to see uh, a little bit later how these myths can even inform public policy. They're not just abstractions. They literally shape the way we think about ourselves and the way we should act. So in the Western myth, the frontier is a moral jungle. The West is a place where the limits of law are all suspended. The West is a place where conflict takes place without boundaries, without limits. It's a place where each person's true character is ultimately revealed. So if you're fundamentally good, that will be unveiled. And if there's weakness in your character or propensity to evil, that too will be revealed. Now, the Western myth that we are going to be talking about today actually had its origins even earlier in time. It was really the creation of one writer, a writer named James Fenimore Cooper who first created this Western myth in the early 19th century. Cooper had gone to college at Yale, and then he got thrown out of Yale because he had put a donkey, an ass, on the teacher's seat and tied the donkey to that. And then he blew up uh, a friend's room uh, in a dormitory with some bomb he constructed. Uh, he then went to sea. He did various things. But his father was a very wealthy landowner, so he never had to work very hard. He was reading a novel one day, and he said, I can write better than that. And his, woman, his wife dared him to, 
And for the next 35 years of his life, he wrote 36 novels. And they were all basically the same novel, if you write that many. They depicted the American hero as a man armed and alone in the wilderness. And that hero was always the same man, but he had different names. He was Hawkeye. That's who I watched on television when I was young. Uh, there was Leather Stocking. There was Natty Bumpo. But they were all really exactly the same person. He is no ordinary man. He is a natural aristocrat. He is a man at home in the wilderness. Now, he does not travel through the wilderness entirely alone. He has a non-white companion named Chingachgook. Okay. And this is important because this model of the white hero and the non-white companion would be crucial in American cultural history, not just in the Lone Ranger and Tonto, but Mel Gibson will have his non-white companion too. This will go on and on in American cultural history. These myths, these images, meet deep needs, and they're repeated again and again and again. Now, inside these leather stocking tales, as they're called, you see a basic story repeated over and over. It's a tale of kidnapping, of chases and rescues, with Nanty at the very end, or Hawkeye or Leather Stocking, left alone uh, when it's over. So Cooper's hero is really an updated version of the medieval knight, except now we have a knight at home in the wilderness. But this character, this Western scout, was very flexible, very malleable. He could easily be adapted. And so in later American history, you will have uh, not just scouts, but cowboys and detectives and superheroes, all of which are modeled on James Fenimore Cooper's Hawkeye. Okay. This one convention could be used over and over again with subtle modifications. There's another aspect of, of Cooper's work that I also should emphasize, and that is there's a deep current of nostalgia in his books. Uh, there's a real sense that civilization is tearing life apart. It's despoiling the natural environment. It's leading to bloodshed and displacement. This deep nostalgia is also a part of the attraction of the Western myth. We all know that the cowboy's mission is to bring progress. The cowboy's mission is to bring civilization to the wilderness. But something's lost, of course, along the way. And so what's wonderful about Cooper and later Westerns is they have it both ways. They both celebrate the advance of civilization, and they also deplore the advance of civilization. They're both forward-looking and they're nostalgic at the very same time. And that's part of their appeal to Americans. So Cooper's hero lives outside the boundaries of urban civilization. He exists in a different psychological world where we can project many of our hopes, dreams, fantasies, and fears. Now, the frontier plays a very important role in the American psyche. Psychologically, the frontier is a place where you can escape. 
It's a place where you can rise above selfishness. It's a place where you can rise above laziness and sloth. It's a place where you can start over. A place of self-renewal after economic or moral ruin. The frontier is also a garden of earthly delights. It's a land endowed with fabulous wealth, yours for the taking. The frontier is also a safety veil where people who live in Houston feel they could always escape to if things turn bad here. Uh, it's a place where you can flee to if things don't work out right. The frontier also serves important ideological functions. It, of course, portrays American history as a struggle, a struggle between advanced people, that's us, and primitive peoples, that's them, for control of the West's fabulous riches. So the Western myth serves all kinds of functions, I think, for American society. It's a fantasy place where we dream we can start over, where we can begin afresh. But it also is an ideological site. That is, it teaches us that history is really the story of a conflict between us and them, between the advanced and the primitive. It also teaches us that the real struggles in American history aren't conflicts among social classes. That has nothing to do with the Western myth. Rather, that progress involves the conquest and subjection of non-white peoples. So the Western, I'm trying to suggest to you, is deeply ideological. It teaches Americans lessons. It doesn't teach them history, though periodically they tell you about episodes that at least Hollywood thought ex it took place, like gunfights at the OK Corral. But what the Western really does is gives us a sense of the very meaning of our history, a sense of who we are and what our actions involve. Westerns involve violence, but it's violence in the service of a good cause. So Westerns teach us not that thou shalt not kill, but rather thou shalt only kill for a good cause and there's lots of good causes to kill for. It teaches us that progress defend, depends on some people being defeated, however sad and unpleasant that might be. It teaches us that we're all in this together, all of us against all of them, and that there are no real deep ethnic or class divisions among us among Americans. Again, what I'm trying to emphasize to you is that the Western is not just innocent entertainment. It's not just a way of spending your Saturday afternoon uh, and feeling a sense of emotional catharsis and release. What the Western is doing is teaching us valuable lessons about ourselves and who we are. And I would suggest to you that the frontier myth still shapes the way we look at the world and still shapes the way we think of ourselves, except with a crucial difference that we now think of ourselves as both cowboys and Indians. Uh, you might remember the movie Rambo with Sylvester Stallone, and he is half India. And we often think of ourselves as being like Hawkeye or Leather Stocking or Natty Bumpo that is part Indian as well as part American. 
We think of ourselves as having a special mission to save the world from evil, just like in High Noon, that most people are cowardly, most people are fearful, most people are paralyzed, and it's our job to stand up and to defend them even the, when they would not defend themselves. We also think of ourselves as being peculiarly in touch with nature, however much we pollute the actual world around us. Let me give an illustration. In 1961, John Kennedy accepted the Democratic nomination for president. In his inaugural address, in his uh, acceptance speech, he called on Americans to end eight years of drift and stagnation, and he said the time had come for Americans to embark upon a new frontier. I mean, that idea that we have an obligation to keep finding new frontiers in order to preserve American character, this is absolutely crucial to the American sense of ourselves. The frontier holds a special mythic significance for the United States. Less than 70 years before Kennedy had given that acceptance speech, a historian named Frederick Jackson Turner had described the conquest of the western frontier as America's formative experience. He argued that the conquest of the West is what had shaped American character and American values. That everything good about Americans, everything that's distinctive about Americans, was shaped by that frontier conquest experience. According to Turner, our individualism, our belief in self-reliance, our commitment to personal freedom, our commitment to democracy, all were products of the conquest of the frontier. And you may think that those are outdated ideas, but don't tell that to advertisers who still feel strongly, and I suspect accurately, that our sense of ourselves as frontiersmen persists even now. Liberals and conservatives, political managers and movie script writers, and advertisers of everything from SUVs to cigarettes, know that you can count on Americans to think of themselves as if they were John Wayne, as rugged, self-reliant, independent, tall in the saddle, ready to act, even if they live in a small apartment in Houston, uh, that their aspiration is to be something different than that. The West remains our symbol personal freedom, of resolve, of righteous anger, of authenticity, of nature. And while the Western film has declined, that idea may not have declined nearly as much. Let's take a break right now. <laughs>